I'm I'm changing up this uh podcast. Oh yeah. We're gonna we're gonna be talking about my my top favorite books <laughs> for self improvement. So you know, got some. Okay. I got a bunch of books out of storage. Yeah. Are you gonna read them out loud to the audience? Yes. Uh, synchronicity for all of you who believe in the law of attraction. Oh. Propaganda, because uh, Lord knows we got a lot of that. And then uh, I think you'll appreciate this beast right here. That is one of my favorite books. Tools of Titans, Tim Ferriss. My boy, Tim. Who's? I like that book because it's very digestible. You can read as little or as much as you like in a one sitting. And it's like just one or two pagers. And so you're just, just, you're just digesting it so fast. It's just full of nugs. Full of gold. Yeah. Full of gold nugs. So today on the real Sound Iron podcast, we're going to be t- <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be talking about piano for non-piano people. So we're going to be talking about getting into MIDI controllers and how to kind of approach practical theory that you can use today if you are a non-piano person, you're a drummer, you're a guitarist and you're trying to do production and you need to be doing MIDI controller stuff. So if you are starting over from scratch, Mr. Craig, how oh, man. how would you approach learning functional piano? Just being able to kind of get around and know what notes you're playing. Oh man. Well, uh I started this whole journey probably shoot back in like 2015 or something like that. Most people who watch our channel, you know, probably seen that I'm more of a guitar player at first. So it was like you know, just trying to know your way around, like learning just everything between starting from like middle C up and, you know, up until the next octave, like, like I'm very uh, pattern oriented. Mm -hmm. I know we've talked about that. So like, it's very easy for me to start seeing patterns and being able to like, okay, like learning just where C is. And then from there, you know, going your way up and understanding what, you know, the black keys and all that. I'm like, I'm trying to remember how I just, uh, I think I just like found some random videos just kind of talking about the basics, Yeah, you know, just going C, D, E, F, G, you know, learning all that. And then once you know those, and then it's like, all right, so if you are on this note and you go back one, you know, then that's like flat. Or if you're going on one note and you go up, you know, so like, you know, like accidentals and stuff. So that's kind of something that could like throw people off, but mainly just like learning what the notes are. And then mm-hmm. from there, when you're trying to learn chords and you see that a chord is, you know, C, E, and G or, you know, or D, F sharp, A, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. But uh, like, that's the thing. Like, I'm I'm not like the the fastest at it. Like for me, it's kind of like once I like learn shapes, then, you know, because I immediately, you know, especially being a guitar player, like you want to start like playing cool stuff and you get a little <laughs> like, I don't want to just be playing Mary Had a Little Lamb. So I'd be trying to learn like how to do like arpeggios and stuff just because it's like. I would try to apply what I know from guitar. Right. Because you know, I already knew like basic music theory and stuff just from doing that. So it was pretty much just trying to port everything over, you know, from what I know to the keyboard. So it's like, okay, I know where this stuff is on the guitar. So then it's like trying to like figure it out. I'm very like trial and error or like try to learn something and then like apply it. You probably have way more tips than I could give because I'm very like self learner kind of thing. Like you actually add lessons and stuff, right? Yeah. I mean, like my primary is not piano, but I definitely took a lot of classes and lessons and stuff so I can get around on on the piano. Um, But as far as starting off, you're absolutely right. Like you want to learn shapes and sounds. Like um, I think of hills and valleys with the black keys and white keys. And so like if you play an E major chord, you have E G sharp and B and your middle finger is on G sharp and it's raised above. And if you play that in both hands, you know what an E major feels like. Mm -hmm. And you also know that an A major feels very similar. And so that's an example of a shape of a chord. And we do the same thing on guitar where your, your shapes like bar chord shapes are the same all the way up to neck. As far as the sound If you are practicing some scales or just learning like your notes in order, the way that I think of scales is just a bag of selected notes. So you're just taking like a random bag, like, all right, I'm going to play in Mixolydian today. And um, I grab the Mixolydian bag or major or whatever. And you want to start getting that sound into your ear so that you know 
what a major chord sounds like, but also what a major scale sounds like. So I do think practicing scales are valuable. I think the like technique and fingering of it is less valuable if you're just doing one-handed melody for MIDI input. But the hearing of it and like the tactile playing is definitely important. Yeah. One exercise that I really like is putting your hand down on a desk or on your keyboard or anything like that and taking two fingers and tapping them on the desk. So you take like your thumb and middle finger together and you're just Mm -hmm. tapping and you'd probably be really good at this because you're a guitarist, but uh, this is really good for finger dexterity and for controlling, just getting that like brain body connection of the fine motor control. Mm -hmm. And then you do your pointer finger and your ring finger together and you're tapping those together. Like for like finger independence. Exactly. Exactly. And then you do your middle finger and your pinky together. And yeah. if, you, if you can do those really easily with both hands, then you're in a really good place for being able to play piano and guitar. Yeah. I remember seeing some uh, guitar players who would do that. They call it like these kind of like spider type things where it would like you're doing like a power chord with like with your first and, and ring. Mm-hmm. And then you would do so like if you're doing like like a, a power chord on on the first fret on the like the top two strings you know you're doing like one and three and then you do like two and four like dun, 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 basically just like a power chord at going up and down a half step kind of thing right. but it's like you're just switching your fingers i was never that good at it but i never really practiced it either i was just kind of like well i don't i would practice more like other types of like finger exercises like or like do 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 you know regular chromatics or like one three two four do 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 like you know just going up but like chromatic or you can do that like on separate strings. Yep. But I guess for getting into doing the the mock-up stuff, because like <laughs> the beauty of step input is the thing that like saved me, especially in the early days, because I, I thought I had to like play everything in when I was like trying to yeah. compose orchestral stuff when I was first kind of getting into it, you know, which was probably probably around like 20, 2015. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say around 2015 because I was working on a, a solo album and I wanted to be able to like have like or- orchestral stuff in it. So I was like learning how to do all that basically while I was writing. That was sort of like my practice, I guess. But yeah, like step input helped me a lot because I'm I'm not like a virtuosic keyboard player. So it was like being yeah. able to just like know where the stuff is. And uh, I think if you have a good ear, you'll probably get along pretty pretty far because if you just kind of like meander your way on the keyboard until you like oh that sounds cool or or i i think it's good to use other instruments you're not that good at when you're composing because i think you'll stumble upon things differently Mm -hmm. so that's kind of the the fun thing like maybe a night not it might not be like correct or whatever how someone would actually play it or or do it that way but yeah it's kind of it's kind of cool yeah i definitely i agree with you like let your ear guide what you're what you're making yeah After you learn your notes and you get comfortable with a few scales, then you want to start doing chords and you want to start with triads, which is just three note chords. So like Mm -hmm. a major chord is, let's say C, E, G is a C major chord. And you can start playing that in both hands and just kind of getting comfortable with how that feels. And then you can start working on arpeggios, which are broken chords so you're just playing one note at a time and you can do different patterns one three five three one you can do three five three one three five three one etc lots of different patterns that you can practice in both hands Mm -hmm. and you're just trying to develop confidence and that finger independence and dexterity in both hands so then once you get good at the arpeggios then you can do inversions Mm -hmm. And inversions are when you change the lowest note that you're playing. So instead of having, uh, if you're playing a C chord, a C major chord, instead of having your thumb play the C as the lowest note, you change your thumb to playing an E and you put the C at the top. Mm -hmm. And that is first inversion. So we just went from a root C major chord to first inversion. Mm Mm-hmm. And that kind of stuff is magic for just unlocking the keyboard and being able to get around comfortably and confidently. Yeah, like that's that's something that I've been trying to practice more lately. Um, and it, it just, yeah, it really does help with 
seeing the same chord in different places, especially when when I was learning more about keyboard or how people would uh, do chord progressions on the keyboard, they would always try to find like the the smallest amount of movement to get to that chord. So yeah. you might start on, you know, like a, a root chord for something, but then the next chord in the progression might just be like one note away. Right. Being able to see that or, you know, that it makes more sense to do more like subtle movements when going from chord to chord. If you can do that instead of just like root chord, root chord, root chord, it just, it doesn't sound as nice as when like, you know, you're playing something like a, like a C major and then you do the, like the relative minor, which is then a minor. So then you just literally move one note up a whole step and you're already there instead right. of having to like go, boom, boom, you know, that sort of thing. And, and, and it just sounds so much more smoother. And especially with like, you know, doing like voice leading or, or things like that, it like, you'll start to see that if you learn the inversions, which that's something that I've been trying to practice, it just, it helps with being able to like, not just go for that root chord unless it's intended but mm -hmm. just being able to like see these other shapes and it, there's so many so it's 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 tough like sometimes i'll spend a day and i'll just play in c major and just go up the inversions or then like or try to arpeggiate like do 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 just you know arpeggiating that that kind of thing yeah or even doing it with one hand with like four fingers like do 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 you know it's uh you know, I, I watch a lot of like Jordan Rudis and he's an amazing keyboard player. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing an old instructional from him and he was like, the first thing you're going to want to learn is inversions. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, I should probably start practicing. That's like, it was one of those things like, you know what you should be working on. But yeah, you know, some like sometimes with me, I get a little like, man, I feel like I need to learn something else or I get bored if I start seeing that I'm doing the same things all the time. Yeah. He's like, so, eat your vegetables. And you're like, I'll get to it later. Yeah. But like, that's yeah, a vegetables, vegetables. <laughs> that's that's a great game. Uh, trying to switch chords with the least movement possible, and that's a mm -hmm. good game on every instrument. Like it's great for guitar, any chordal instrument where you can think about, okay, I need to move a couple notes different. What's the easiest, most efficient way to get there? Mm -hmm. So speaking of chords, there's a video called Seven Common Chord Progressions and Why They Work, and this guy basically just breaks down a bunch of pop progressions and he's like, all right, here's a bunch of songs that use this progression and here's why it sounds good. Here's why it pulls your ear this direction. Here's why it rocks basically. <laughs> and we will link this video in the description, but um, he's got names for everything and he uses the Roman numeral system. So like one, five, six, four, that kind of stuff is mm -hmm. great. Like pop theory, definitely helpful to know if you're, especially if you're playing in an ensemble, like playing with other people, mm -hmm. but it also helps to just kind of have some foundational movement that you're thinking about. Like, okay, I know that I can go from my C chord to a G chord and that's one to five. Yeah. And those are called cadences. And uh, those are just like, you take two chords and you're switching between them. Um, typically, you'll hear like five, one, and that's like a big in classical music. That's like a big cadence, like a final. Oh, like bam, bam, bam. Right, right, right. So that's like an authentic cadence where you have the big ending, the the big finale. But pop has the same kind of things where you have different cadences that you can do. So if you go like five to minor six. That is called a deceptive cadence. And it's like, hey, we tricked you. Well, you thought we were going to go 5 1. You thought we were going to go back to home base, the root, but we actually went to the minor six chord. Mm. Um, so there's all kinds of little things that you can practice, little chord progressions that you can practice that are just cadences. And those, you can play the same game where you're just trying to like switch or move as few fingers as possible, as efficiently as possible. So mm -hmm. going from one to five, one to four, five to six, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. There's also another video that I found called How to Imitate a Whole Lot of Hollywood Film Music in Four Easy Steps. And this dude, this is an old video. This is from 2015. But this I think, guy, yeah, you've probably think, seen it. 
Yeah, is it the one where like the the thumbnail is like a keyboard with like colored keys, like yeah. orange and green key? Yeah, yeah. I was actually about to talk. About, I'll, I'll let you finish, but yeah, it, uh, it's I'm gonna cool let video. you finish. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not gonna cut you off. Sorry, <laughs> Mister Mister West. Um, yeah, this video basically gives you all the cadences for classical or scored movies that you know and love. Mm-hmm. So it's like, all right, if you want to play a C minor to an E major that is taken from this famous score. Here's Mm -hmm. what it sounds like. And you could practice that cadence of those two chords and then you could just rip off Howard Shore. Yeah. Or, or was it like, or, uh, or like C minor to D major is that kind of like Batman sound. Yeah. 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 Like, um, I, I talked to, I think I brought this up a little bit when we were, we were talking on a previous podcast where, um, the harmonic relativity thing where just like the the sound of like just taking like a major chord and then just like moving it somewhere else and then playing another major chord whether it's like a fifth apart or a sixth apart or or whatever and just like even just going between like c major to d major or then mm-hmm. like c major to e major like they have these like different kind of feelings to them and it's pretty cool because like i i like using those sometimes because i feel like they inspire me a little bit more than just kind of writing in a key like i'm not a, a real big like i'm gonna write in d major today yeah like sometimes when i'm learning like a new scale i'll learn i'll try to learn the chords with it because sometimes it'll inspire something different but it's usually just because it's more of like i'm just practicing like i want to learn you know like uh, a flat major is uh one that i've heard a lot of people say that has like a really nice sound so it's like oh let me like learn some learn some of that and then play around with using like uh spread triads and stuff that's another one that i remember i, I first learned of that terminology from rick beato mm-hmm. where you have like the one and the five in your left hand but then you play a third and octave up and it just has like this really nice open spread sound and it sounds yeah. really good especially with strings you know, when you're thinking about, you know, you have this chord, like how, how there's a million ways you can orchestrate something, but sometimes, you know, like, oh, I'm going to have like my basses playing like the lowest uh, C or the cellos are playing like, like a one and a five. And then the violas are playing, uh, or maybe violas and, and violins playing that, uh, that third, mm-hmm. you know, and just like hearing it really spread apart. I, I like experimenting with that kind of stuff. But yeah, the harmonic relativity stuff is, is pretty interesting because you can get lost in it. Oh, yeah. It's definitely, there's a lot to think about there. (laughs) So that's Alan Silvestri's Back to the Future. And he's just doing a C sharp to a D sharp. C sharp major to D sharp major. Mm -hmm. And that is like that whole little theme. That little motive is just those two chords. So I took to Reddit and Reddit said... The best way to learn piano as an adult is to go to YouTube. Big shocker there. But (laughs) Michael New is who everyone recommended. Mm -hmm. So this guy doesn't really post anymore, but he's got a wealth of information on his YouTube channel. Michael New, thank you for your service, sir. (laughs) And his most popular video is The Circle of Fifths, How to Actually Use It, which is solid. Then his next most popular is How Basic Chords Work, Music Theory Lesson 1. And his videos are typically between 15 minutes and 30 minutes long. And so they're great crash courses on what you need to know to get around on the piano. Nice. It, how do you spell his last name? It's just N-E-W. Oh, okay. Like new stuff. The other one I really liked was Andrew Wong has a learn music theory in half an hour video. And it's 31 minutes long. And he does notes, then chords, major and minor, the number system, inversions, melodies, and rhythm. And he just gives you a solid crash course, lots of uh, little rabbit holes that you can kind of pick and choose to go down later. But if you're trying to get a fundamental understanding of the theory, that's a great place to start. And piano, in my opinion, is like the most efficiently laid out instrument for learning theory because Mm -hmm. everything's just right at your fingertips and you can see where the octaves are really easily yeah guitar yeah guitar and piano have their different quirks like with you know guitar you can just do a bar chord and just go just literally just slide that whole thing up or if you have like an arpeggio you could just just play it up chromatically (laughs) piano is 
it, it that's where it's difficult like like with inversions and like certain like chord shapes on guitar like things are different because with the b is it the b string or the g string that's g string oh yeah oh yeah g2 b is different than everything yeah because like you it's like a at the fourth fret and the open b when you're tuning it right uh so yeah certain shapes are a little a little different but it's like some things are very easy on the on on the piano and then some things are difficult like for me i have a hard time playing scales that incorporate a lot of the black keys sure is especially with you know with like figuring out the right sort of you know do i do like a thumb index middle and then shift my thumb over like for for some it's a little weird or like playing arpeggios like incorporating like if there's like two black keys it feels a little like i have kind of like thicker fingers so sometimes it's a little hard to like get in there <laughs> not to brag no it's not a brag i wish i had like like really thin alien fingers or something it'd probably be a little bit easier yeah piano like the professional piano players typically do have very long slender fingers yeah and it, yeah that that's where like things like that are a little bit difficult for me yeah i would say one thing if you're trying to kind of put new tools in the tool bag is to pick it pick one scale for the week and start playing that scale and so like let's say i really like dorian which mm -hmm. is basically a minor scale with a raised sixth and it's kind of got that adventure-y we're going on a, a journey sort of sound mm -hmm. and you can there's several tools like software tools where you could lock the scale to dorian we mm -hmm. have a bunch in our modular template that you can easily lock everything to like d dorian for instance mm -hmm. um and you'll start to hear that sound in your ear and you know, okay, there's that raised sixth again. Like I, I can start hearing that adventure sound that doesn't sound like major. And you can start playing D Dorian, which is just all white keys starting from uh, the D, mm -hmm. basing your chords around that. And once the week is out and you've composed a couple pieces with D Dorian, then that is now in your tool bag and it's ready to use and you can pull it out in a different key like a different route later on, or you can use it and transition to some other chord type or scale. Yeah, I think it's really good to to try and hear how certain scales are. Like usually for me, it would it would be like trying to break down something that I like. Like why do I like that? Yeah. Like with certain film scores, a lot of people are like like Lydian it has that very like kind of that same sort of like my when I first heard about Lydian it was because of Joe Satriani and Steve Vai okay because a lot of their stuff sounds very kind of not spacey in the terms of just like using like augmented chords where it just sounds like like an old spaceship or something like <laughs> that kind right. of thing but it has this very kind of little little mysterious I guess oh, yeah. but when you hear it in the context of like film scores you know like where it just has that like let's say you're doing like C major to like D D major because mm -hmm. you have that like you know when you're playing in C Lydian you know you have that that sharp four so it has that kind of like -da 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 -da. it just sounds very like almost that same sort of kind of like adventure too it feels like you're like leaning and flying into something you know yeah you're going somewhere there's no like safe home spot uh John Williams is the king of Lydian in my opinion yeah. I mean he uses it in almost every score and it just yeah it has like a, a really cool sound but then it's like you you start to be able to identify that even by just hearing it mm -hmm. like i i i don't have i wish i had perfect pitch well, maybe i say that because i don't but if i had it i'd probably go crazy or something but like sometimes do you, do you feel like you're you're able to tell a note just by hearing it because you recognize it from a piece of music yeah yeah so like sometimes that helps and i, I think i saw a video by uh oh, i can't remember his name uh chris something he used to make all those like funny like piano memes where he was like playing to like cardi b like talking really fast or something oh, yeah. he, has a, he has a really good youtube channel but he was he was talking about uh perfect pitch and uh like charlie puth and jacob collier and stuff and he was saying if you don't have perfect pitch like a great way to kind of develop that is to like be able to identify notes from music that you know Mm -hmm. So he, because he was like, yeah, like I, I'll hear this piece of music, and you know, when it goes to that, dun, you know, I'm like, oh, I know that's a B flat or whatever. And then for anyone who has perfect pitch, is gonna yell at me right now because I didn't sing a B flat. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, you know what I mean. I used to keep a tuning fork in my pocket, and I'll just play it like I would just hit it and put it against my ear all the time for that A for a forty. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's music nerd right there. Huh? Yeah, I don't think I ever did that. I don't think well i think when i when i was younger i didn't really care too much <laughs> like now i'm like I, I probably should have practiced that more 
Right. The other thing that you can do, and you kind of touched on this earlier, but you can find a score that you really like. Uh, for me, it's like Danny Elfman's Batman or Edward Scissorhands. Mm-hmm. Find find a theme that you like and figure out the chord progression and just rip it. Rip it off. Just rip it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the great artists steal. So you can take that chord progression. You can write a different melody. You can put it in a different key. You can use a different tempo, different instrumentation. But you can like make it your own, obviously. But you can have that foundational start with someone else's chord progression. Mm-hmm. And that's a great way to grab a new cadence and and use it. Yeah. Um, there's there's a, a guy on YouTube. Um, I'd love to have him on the podcast sometime. Uh, might be in the future. His name is Zach Heidi. And he does a lot of stuff like that where he's like, oh, we're going to compose. Like he recently did one for like a Nightmare Before Christmas. Okay. And just kind of like listening to it, hearing the instrumentation, some of the orchestration, and then kind of like doing something like very close. It's pretty much exactly what you were saying. And it's really cool to kind of like see someone else interpret something you know, not they're not trying to do it like verbatim or something. Yeah, it's not like a perfect mock-up. Yeah, but it's it's pretty cool because like you're like, oh, okay, like you know, the English horn is doing this thing, and then like for the strings, it's like this, even though it's like a different little chord progression or it's kind of based off of it, it's kind of using similar orchestration. So like you're you're training your ear to be able to like hear that stuff. Yeah. And then just kind of interpret it in your own way. And like that's kind of like what I what I used to do too. Like, and I I don't have any like music training so a lot of this stuff for me is very like wing it and experimentation yeah and and um you know it's it's more a lot more ear training than really like knowing exactly what i'm doing or like why does that work right uh you know it's just more or less like i i know what i want it to sound like and it's just a matter of like (laughs) figuring it out yeah um but yeah that that's that's a really good tip the actual act of playing piano you want to have like be sitting up straight. You want to have nice, relaxed limbs, and you want to kind of have the the weight of everything be falling from your shoulders. Mm-hmm. And you don't want anything to be tense, you, especially not your wrists and fingers, because we don't want you get to we don't want you getting carpal tunnel mm-hmm. uh, because that's a that's a real thing. But you also want nice curved fingers when you're playing, so you never want like flat fingers. Um, whenever you're playing the keys, you want to just have a nice curvature and let everything fall. And people talk about like a balloon inside, but a tennis ball would be similar. Something that you have inside there that you can't let pop. That's what like uh, kids, teachers talk about. Like don't let your balloon pop inside the hands. So the next level of all of it is adding the the fourth note to the chord. Mm. So this is adding extensions this is adding like sixths and ninths and sevenths you got major sevenths and dominant sevenths and that's kind of the next level of all of it that adds more flavor and color to your music Mm -hmm. and it also makes it sound like you know a little bit more like what you're doing if instead of playing root 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 you're playing root with a major seven in it too Mm -hmm root with a different major seven right and that kind of expands your color palette significantly and the the only way to really get that like to grasp that solidly is to learn your scales and to know your keys like what the actual seventh is or six right so you got to know what the uh the function of the seven is yeah like the scale degrees of the actual scale like um, that was actually something I was gonna bring up earlier. Like, like when when people think like the one and the five, some people are like, "Well, why is it the five? You know, yeah. like, oh, it's the you know fifth, yeah, fifth note of the scale or whatever." But you know, like especially when you're learning, like, oh, like the flat three, and it's like, what, what, like you know, <laughs> knowing that kind of thing, and that's like the kind of stuff that it's super basic music theory kind of thing. Because I remember when I was trying to get into it, I was like, like, what's the like, oh, you play the flat three or like the harmonic minor's got like a flat three and a raised seven. And you're like, what does that even mean? You know, <laughs> but but going back to what you're saying, like, well, yeah, when you're playing in a certain key and you want to add that seventh, like you want to actually add it right to not just like random notes, actually kind of like understand it a little bit. Right. The other thing that I would say is you don't have to get proficient in every key. I know that it's like popular to be like, okay, we got to practice our scales in all 12 keys. But really, if you get super proficient as a MIDI person in 
a couple keys, like key of C, key of G, key of F. You can just drag and drop. You can drag <laughs> to other keys. Uh, I mean, it's ideally you would want to learn more as you pursue new instrumentation and new new sounds and like okay mm-hmm. let's hear what the key of d sounds like and start working with that f sharp and c sharp but at first you can get really really good at playing in the key of c and that's mm-hmm. okay like just being able to compose in in one key because i mean yeah you could always like i, I wouldn't want to do this because i would feel like it would be cheating but you know like sometimes you could if just you like select all the midi in your in your thing and just like do 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 I do like, that. Oh, yeah. And you're like, oh, it's, and it's it's crazy because like you can compose something. Let's say you compose it in C major. Mm-hmm. And then you're like, oh, what if I just like transpose this up? And then you're like, oh, like this has a totally different feel. Now. Exactly. So you go from like C major to E flat major, which is a very common, like that minor third transition is a very common film music thing. I'm not like playing in E flat later in the piece. I'm just mm-hmm. moving everything up in the MIDI. And now it's an E flat major. Sometimes I would try that and like, oh, like I actually want to like have all this in in this key or something. But then I'd have to like relearn what that is. Sure. Like, oh, like like now I want to keep composing in it or something. So it's like, I guess if that's the case, just like do it all in one and then just transpose it all of it or something. Yeah. Or it's also good too. I think like if say you want to, you know, because like minor chords and major chords, they have like certain formulas, you know, Mm -hmm. it's like major, minor, minor, major, major. Uh, minor uh, half diminished i think is like for c yeah you're doing this the key of c yeah and you know if you know the 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 scale and the chords of that you know maybe playing that in in your daw and then transposing it into another key and then like learning that or something or just being able to know those formulas because uh uh, ashton gleckman did a, a cool video a long time ago where he was talking about composing and knowing formulas for like the major and minor or like diminished and stuff like that and i was like oh that's pretty pretty useful because if like if you know those you can kind of figure it out Mm -hmm. you know like the chords and stuff that would be within that scale right and the same thing goes for learning a specific chord like every chord has its own formula so like a major chord is you have your root and then you do four half steps and then you do three half steps so you can build each chord if you know that formula of how many half steps and you can build it anywhere on the keyboard same Mm -hmm. thing same idea with minor like a minor chord you have your root and then it's plus three half steps and then plus four half steps Mm -hmm. so those kind of things are really nice especially when you're like what's the augmented seven again i i forgot and you can look that formula up and then you have your chords yeah because what is it with diminished it's like the one flat three flat five yep and then augmented is like it's a major third and then it's a oh yeah, oh yeah it's all whole steps basically so it's, yeah, it's like, a raised five c e g sharp i would say get really comfortable with the piano roll so people talk about hans zimmer and how he can't read sheet music or he doesn't read proficiently on western notation but he's like the fastest gun in the west when it comes to reading piano roll like your midi mm-hmm. sheet he can just be like adjusting thirds and sevenths on the fly. He can be transposing. He can be speeding things up, chopping things up. And he just knows exactly where the notes are and what they look like on the timeline in that mm-hmm. piano roll. So that's a perfect example of learning with the actual tools that you're using. It's funny because I feel like I should know how to read notation i think i just kind of beat myself up because i'm just like i'm just so not really interested in it i guess it would be like if i was doing a job that required me to then i would learn it yeah but uh it's it's like learning another language or something like if you're not going to be using it all the time you're probably just going to forget and that's kind of how i am like if i'm not using it all the time i'll just it'll just go away Mm -hmm. you know like i'll know like basic little things but being um more proficient in in the piano role like that i'm more within that that sort of field like because i use that more that's more of like the the medium at which i am usually creating music so you know and then you can always just like take that and print out the notation or whatever from cubase you could do that like having the score editor and all that stuff so it's kind of like you can still be able to like give that to a live player Mm -hmm. even though i didn't necessarily like 
go in by hand and or have my my you didn't write it in uh, quill ink or a pencil exactly yeah so it's really just a matter of like there's no real right or wrong it's really just like how you work Mm -hmm. and but i I know there are some people that are like you gotta learn how to read notation but it's like you don't really use it like i doubt skrillex is over there like yeah man i gotta learn out learn notation he's literally just doing midi right (laughs) You would be shocked at how many famous people do not know how to read sheet music. And that's okay. Or or even no theory, probably. Like, there's so many, like, talented people who I've, you know, heard or, like, really like their music. And they're like, you know, if you ask them, like, oh, so, like, what's that music theory-wise? They're like, I don't know. But they do have fantastic ears. They know what sounds good. Yeah, that's that's usually the key. Because I think some people get a little hung up on music theory. And it can almost be a little crippling. And I feel like that even when I've tried to write that way, like, oh, I, I feel, you know, I'm gonna try to write in this key or whatever. And then I just get kind of like, I feel like I'm a little too boxed in. I like to just like experiment and let my fingers and ear kind of take me where I've, you know, because sometimes you might just do something wrong and you're like, oh, that's kind of interesting and takes you down a certain path. And I feel like kind of lends to a little bit more interesting music. It doesn't sound too carbon copy or whatever like some people might be like well that that, theoretically that's not right but i don't care about that that has no interest to me about you know like it having to be correct unless it just sounds wrong yeah but for some people that have their ears trained a certain way like especially like with classical music you know like there's very like there's rules (laughs) it's like sometimes if you break them some people get a little upset but it's okay i think on that note Pun intended. We are done with piano for non-piano people. I don't know if you have anything else. Yeah, I would. I would just say, like, yeah, go on YouTube. Like, there's some really cool YouTube channels. Um, uh, there's this one called Piano, P I A N O T E, and uh, they have some really cool basic piano lessons and stuff. I would recommend that every now and again. Well, lately I've been trying to do a little bit more working on the on the keyboard. You know, just to you know try Tick, to get better. Tickling the ivories. Uh, tickling the plastics or I don't know what these are for the native instrument. Yeah. But, uh, um, but yeah, that's a really good channel. Uh, they have a lot of really cool basic stuff. Scour the internet. It's the information's out there or get piano lessons too. But I'm, I have, I'm too hard headed and stubborn to get lessons. I'm like, screw that. But maybe one day I will. The main (laughs) thing is just putting time in. I mean, it's like shooting baskets. If you're trying to play basketball, like if you're trying to get better at piano, you got to play piano. Yeah, you can't get good at piano if you're out there shooting baskets. So you gotta pick one. <laughs> you can't get good at piano by just watching YouTube videos either. That's that's another thing. Yeah, it's very true. It's like it's like uh watching a bunch of um motivational stuff. Like, <laughs> yeah, I feel great. And then uh like, oh, so you start that business adventure yet? <laughs> uh, uh no, I I'm gonna watch a couple more Gary Vee videos and you know, <laughs> then I'm gonna do it. <laughs> Got him. Got him. <laughs> Uh, Okay, so let's move to the recommendations section. Uh, I have two recommendations. Actually, no, I have three. Big day, big day. So number one, PanFlow by Audio Modern is a free plugin that I just found, and I've been putting it on everything, and I'm just like so thrilled with myself. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna hate myself when I listen to it like in a month, but I'm, I'm really excited about this plugin. It's just like it's very similar to their Filter Step and their gate lab where you just randomize a sequence and it does like a panning envelope. And so it's kind of like auto pan, but it's way fancier. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, yeah. And your, your recent composition video, I saw that you were using that and I was like, Oh yeah, that kind of, kind of reminds me of auto pan and Cubase, but uh, it looks like Panflow actually has a little bit more like the way that the curves and stuff. Are drawn. Yeah. So you can draw yeah, your own, you can draw your own curves or you can just randomize, which I'm a sucker for a random button. What can I say? Yeah. I randomize my life. Bam, bam, bam. <laughs> uh, number two is I just finished the Pacific on HBO max, which is about Marines in world war two going Island to Island uh, in Asia, like fighting the Japanese, very powerful, very heavy. If you're into World War II history, it's a must watch, I think. And number three is Huberman Lab. My uh, my buddy over there just put out a fitness toolkit, and it is a two-hour podcast on everything fitness, like basically how to optimize your fitness and make sure you're doing everything perfectly. He talks about like seated heel raises so if you're just sitting in a plane or sitting at a desk forever like you should just be 
raising your heels up and down. Just doing and like calf raises? Calf raises, exactly. Yeah, so just just like little hacks like that for your daily life. And he also has a sleep toolkit for better sleep and a focus toolkit for better focus. Interesting. You know, there's another thing that I remember learning a long time ago. Like I was trying to learn about like stuff that you can do without weights, like like for curls. Like if you like put one hand on top of your wrist and like use it, like you can kind of like anything that's like resistance or uh, uh-huh. if you take your hands together and like kind of like cup them in front of your chest and like push them together. Like you oh, can yeah. do like kind of like chest chest exercises, like just by like kind of pushing and flexing with your own body. Yeah, just like using the, your own body resistance. Yeah, the, I, I haven't heard that uh, the the heel raises though, but I don't need those because my calves are already too big. You got massive calves. Yeah, it, they're just naturally big. Like it's funny because when I started working out a long time ago, it was, I was trying to get everything to look proportionate to my calves because I don't know. <laughs> I think because I walked like Charlie Brown or something, so they just naturally already kind of. Dude, you could be a calf model. Uh, no, no one wants to see that. <laughs> Uh, you got any recommendations? Anything you've been listening, watching, playing with? I haven't really been watching anything too specific. Uh, I've been watching Intervention a lot. What's that? You never seen Intervention? Where it's like they they uh, document people who have like addictions to either like you know drugs or alcohol. Okay. And um, yeah, been watching that. Um, have you seen The Sopranos when they have an intervention with Christopher? No, I haven't seen The Sopranos. I've seen maybe like episodes here and there. I know. I, I see sorry, you over sorry, there. Sorry, you got to fix that. I know. That's 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 my recommendation to myself. Watch The Sopranos. What am people I doing already probably think you're Italian, right? Yeah. Some people might think I'm Italian. Some people might think I'm French. I don't know. I don't I don't know what I am anymore. I'm just a, hu- I'm just a human trying, just to, a trying metal to live. Just a metalhead. Uh, you are celebrating the Halloween season, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was watching the, the the new Hellraiser. I would recommend not to watch it because I didn't think it was very good. Oh, okay. Um, I, thought you, <laughs> I thought you had recommended it to me. Yeah, I recommended it. Well, I well, well, I was actually telling you to watch the original. Got it. I was curious if you were going to watch the new one, but then when you told me that you hadn't seen the original, I was like, well, you need to watch that one. <laughs> I, I was actually watching a, a bunch of horror movies. I mean, yeah, I would recommend that. It's Halloween coming up. It's October. Watch some horror movies. Come on, pick, what are you doing? Pick with your, your favorite. Life? Pick your favorite horror movies. Mine. Yeah. Uh, we were just singing Nightmare Before Christmas, right before this. That's not horror, man. You gotta watch like Texas Chainsaw Massacre or something. Or oh, okay, bloody the Exorcist. Exorcist one or three. Exorcist three is actually pretty scary. It might even be. No, I wouldn't say it's scarier than the first one, but in, in some ways. Yeah, I typically stay like on the nicer side of the Halloween movies. Yeah, you're like you know, like like Krampus or something. You're Big like, oh, Casper the Friendly Ghost fan. Oh God, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, you're killing me here. <laughs> I would recommend to go over to our website. We're doing a Halloween sale right now where you can save up to sixty percent off. That's what's pretty, up. Uh, pretty big savings. The more you put in your cart, actually, the more you save. So it's the best time to get anything. If your uh, horror scoring palette's a little looking a little low, we got plenty of that for you. What's your favorite horror library that we have? Ooh, six six the sickening that one's one of my favorites because it's got a lot of really cool string creepy string stuff um friendo is one of my favorites uh music box is on sale that's a really awesome one sometimes i i'll I'll use other ones that aren't even in the 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 horror stuff for horror i I, it it depends you put something in my hands i'll probably try to i'll probably end up trying to make it sound scary i think mine uh, my favorite is probably theremin the U from the Bart Hopkins collection is really great. Oh, yeah. And the Water Harp. Oh, yeah. Water Harp. Yeah. I, I use that one all the time, too. Actually, uh, that the horror scoring competition that we're going to, that we've, well, by the time <laughs> you've heard this, it's been announced. Uh, the little stuff, little composition for that, scoring some stuff. So if you're hearing this now and you haven't checked that out, you should definitely do that. Yeah, start getting your horror chops going because we're about to do a Halloween competition. The Creator Challenge Halloween Edition. Sound Iron Creator (laughs) Challenge. Oh. All right. On that note, we will wrap it here. Mm -hmm. Good luck playing piano as a non-piano person, but you can turn into a piano person with just hours of practice. That's all it takes. You know, just 10,000 hours (laughs) or 50 years for me. It's going to take me 50 years to get good. All right, Craig, I'll catch you next week. (laughs) All right, man. Later. Peace.